Hello and welcome to the ISTQB mobile application training and certification program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB certified professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes, and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, two sample question papers. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and an experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB mobile application training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified. Let's answer a million dollar question. How to clear ISTQB exam in the first attempt? Let me tell you this straightforward. ISTQB exam is not difficult, but tricky. Questions are asked in a way that you get confused. This is the success rate graph from the ISTQB official website. You can see that only 74% of the people could clear the ISTQB Agile level exam in their first attempt. So you must know what approach you should follow to clear the exam. I suggest this approach based on our experience. Step 1. Watch the video lecture. Step 2. Read the corresponding topic in the ISTQB official PDF. Step 3. Solve the quiz so you understand the types of questions asked previously. Step 4. If the topic is of type K3, solve as many practice questions as possible. We have provided many such questions in our course. Follow these four steps. For sure you will clear the exam. And yes, for any doubt, reach us directly. Our experts will help you throughout your preparation. So, all the best for your ISTQB exam. Hello, and welcome to the Chapter 1, Mobile World of Mobile Application Testing. These are the keywords which you must know at the end of this chapter. Risk Analysis Risk Mitigation risk-based testing, and test strategy. Along with the keywords, we are going to address these learning objectives. Mobile analytics data, business models for the mobile app, mobile device type, types of mobile applications, mobile application architecture, test strategy for mobile apps, and challenges of mobile application testing. Now let's start the chapter. Before getting into foundation levels, let's understand the basics of mobile testing. In this lecture, we will cover these topics. First, we will see what is mobile software application testing. Next, we will see why testing is needed and then we will cover the overview of mobile application testing. Let's start with the first question. What is mobile application testing? 
Mobile application testing is done to check whether the mobile application software is working as expected or as per the specified document. And the aim of mobile testing is to find an error, defect, or failure. For example, test login scenario of a website. For this scenario, the tester aims to test if the login functionality of the website is working as expected or not. So in the mobile testing, our aim is to test the mobile application software if it's working as per requirement or not. Now the next question is why we need testing. And the answer to this is very simple. We all are human and being human, we are bound to make mistakes. Some of those mistakes are unimportant, but some of them are critical and may lead to loss of money, delay in delivery, loss of reputation, and it could result in injury or death. This is the reason to assure a certain level of quality before an application is released into the market or to the customer. Now let's see the last topic of this lecture. Overview of Mobile Application Testing As we know, today mobile phones have evolved from simple communication devices to a gadget that can basically do everything. Whether it be ordering food, availing a cab service, booking movie tickets, or simply looking for directions, it can all be done using a mobile phone. This is only possible due to the wonderful world of mobile applications. Mobile application testing is the process every application developed for handheld devices has to go through. First, the developer develops these applications and before giving it to the customer, it goes through the process which aims to find the defect in developed applications and this process is called testing. And since we are testing mobile applications, we call it as mobile application testing. Mobile application development lifecycle generally tends to be much shorter than others. Hence, it heavily depends on mobile application testing for their success. With this, we covered the basics where we covered what is mobile software application testing, why testing is needed, and an overview of mobile application testing. In this lecture, we will cover the business models for mobile apps. Here is the learning objective. It is to distinguish between various business models for mobile applications, and it is marked as K2. Let's first understand what is the business model. A business model is a framework for generating revenues. A business model defines the sources that generate income. It is an integral part of a business concept and it is the document that should be created before going into the development stage. Now we'll see a few examples of business models to understand it better. These are some of the business models. Freemium model, advertisement-based model, transaction-based model, fee-based model, enterprise application, and in addition, an in-app purchase can be applied to some of these models. There are certain advantages and disadvantages for each of these approaches, and the tester should keep the business model in mind whilst testing the mobile application. Now we will cover each of these models. Let's start with the first model, freemium model. Freemium model is a model where applications are used free of cost. If the user needs any additional feature, then those can be added in an application by paying additional price. In the freemium model, 
the feature should be enough existing or useful to have the user download it. Also, the paid additional advanced feature should be existing and worthful for which a large number of users would be willing to pay. For example, the WhatsApp application is a freemium model. The second model is advertisement-based applications. Advertisement-based applications display advertisements on the screen of the application when the user uses it. The advertisement is a source revenue generation if the application are used for relatively long periods of time. The user interface designers must take care when displaying the advertisements. Ads must not hide the important function of the application. Ads should not cause distraction and make user dislike using the application. For example, the Ghana application is an advertisement-based application. The third model is transaction-based applications. The application that charges the user for the transaction is called transaction-based application. Transaction-based applications charge the users either per transaction, a flat fee, or a percentage of the transaction value or similar. This type of business model is suitable for a limited number of applications only and is usually applied for business and financial apps. For example, Mobile wallets are transaction-based applications. The fourth model is fee-based applications. Fee-based applications are applications that require the users to pay for downloading and installing the application. While deciding the fee-based business model should take the thoughts that large numbers of free or freemium options exist for most application types. The user will install an application that requires to pay only if the application is outstanding features or usability or when competing applications are not available. For example, Udemy is fee-based application. The fifth model is free and enterprise applications. Free and enterprise applications are the application that is used by companies internally. Enterprise applications do not charge their users as it's used in internal people banks or e-commerce companies used free and enterprise applications within their organization. These apps are not used for monetary gain. For example, Enterprise Resource Planning ERP, software is free and enterprise applications example. Now let's summarize the points we discovered until now. These are the models we covered. Freemium, advertisement-based, transaction-based, fee-based, enterprise applications, and the application that can be used free of cost are called freemium. Advertisement-based applications display advertisements on the screen of the application when the user uses it. An application that charges the user for the transaction is called transaction-based application. Fee-based applications are applications that require the users to pay for downloading and installing the application. Free and enterprise applications are the application that is used by companies internally. Now. We will do a memory mapping exercise so that you remember the important points before we proceed further. Now the statement will appear on your screen. Please read them by yourself and identify the suitable business model.
In this lecture, we will cover mobile device types. And here, the learning objective is to recall different types of mobile devices. This topic is marked as K1. As we said in the introductory lecture, the mobile devices have evolved from simple communication devices to a gadget that can basically do everything. This shows the evaluation of mobile phones. Initially, we had the basic phones, and after basic phones, we got featured phones. After featured phones, smartphones came into the market. After smartphones, we got tablets. And now we also have companion devices and some IoT appliances. Let's see each of these devices one by one. The first device is basic phones. The basic phones are used for telephone and SMS only and provide very few built-in apps and games. The installation of apps or browsing is not possible. Let's see featured phones. A featured phone is a mobile phone that retains the basic phone functionality. These phones provide limited support for apps and app installation. They provide internet access via a built-in browser and may have some additional hardware such as cameras. After featured phones, smartphones came into the market. These phones perform many of the functions like a computer, typically having a touchscreen interface and internet access. The operating system capable of downloading and running downloaded apps. After smartphones, we got tablets. Tablets are similar to smartphones, but are physically larger. They are typically used when a larger display is needed or desired. And now, we also have companion devices and some IoT appliances. Companion devices and some IoT appliances are computer powered devices commonly used together with a smartphone or tablet to extend the available functionality or to give access to the data on the phone or tablet in a more convenient way. The companion device having wireless connectivity. The primary device sending and receiving data via a communication channel established over its wireless connectivity. Watches and fitness bands are examples of popular wearables. These are the mobile devices we discussed. Basic phones, feature phones, smartphones, tablets, and companion devices. The statement will now appear on your screen. Please read them by yourself and identify the suitable mobile device.
In this lecture, we will cover types of mobile applications. The learning objective is to distinguish between different types of mobile applications. These are the three main types of mobile applications, native, browser-based, and hybrid. We will cover each of these in detail. The first type of mobile application is native application. A native app or a native application is a software application built in a specific programming language for the specific device platform, either iOS or Android. Native iOS apps are written in Swift or Objective-C and native Android apps are written in Java. For example, Swift or Objective-C is used to write native iOS apps and Java is used to write native Android apps. Apple and Google offer app developers their own development tools, interface elements, and standardized SDK, Xcode, and Android Studio. These tools allow any professional developer to develop a native mobile app relatively easily. Native apps offer the fastest, most reliable, and most responsive experience to users. This is all about native application. The second type of mobile application is browser-based applications. There are four main ways in which mobile web applications are created. Mobile-specific versions of websites and applications. Responsive web apps adaptive web apps, and progressive web apps, and here, mobile-specific versions of websites and applications is a mobile version of the application opened in browser, also known as m.sites. For example, facebook.com redirects to m.facebook.com when accessed from a mobile device. The second one is responsive web apps. This ensures that the design adjusts to the form factor and screen size, usually expressed as viewports. The third one is adaptive web apps, which adjust the design according to some predefined sizes. The last one is progressive web apps. This allows shortcuts of specific web pages to be created on the mobile home screen. The third type of mobile application is hybrid apps. Hybrid apps like web apps are built with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and they run in something called a web view, a simplified browser within your app. They are a combination of native apps and web apps. You install it like a native app, but it's actually a web app on the inside. And instead of building two apps, you're building one app and simply tweaking it a bit so it works on both platforms, iOS and Android. With a hybrid app, you only have one code base to manage. They are relatively easy to develop update, and maintain without updating the app installed on the device. Possible weak points for these apps include performance issues due to the use of a wrapper and possible divergences from the expected look and feel because of platform-specific aspects. Native and hybrid apps are installed physically on a device and are therefore always available to the user with and without internet application, unlike the browser-based app. Few hybrids are installed when we purchase mobile phones, for example, Calendar. Some can be installed from the Apple Store, Google Play Store, Enterprise App Stores, available only inside the enterprise network, and third-party application markets. We discussed three different types of app and testing of each of these application types may require a different approach. We need to consider these parameters for testing. Different types of devices to be supported, for example, iOS, Android, Windows, and etc. 
sensor and device features to be used, for example, microphone, touchscreen sensor, and GPS. Availability under various network conditions, for example, 2G, 3G, 4G, SIM card, and installability, compatibility, performance efficiency, and usability. These are the three main types of mobile application we covered in this lecture. Native, browser-based, and hybrid. Where a native app or a native application is a software application built in a specific programming language. For the specific device platform, either iOS or Android. Then we cover four main ways in which mobile web applications are created. Mobile specific versions of websites and applications, responsive web apps, progressive web apps, and adaptive web apps. And the hybrid app is a combination of native app and web app. The statements will now appear on your screen. Please read them by yourself and identify the suitable mobile application. In this lecture, we will cover mobile application architecture. Here, the learning objective is to distinguish between general architecture types of mobile applications 
and it is marked as K2. We are dividing this lecture into two parts. In this lecture, we will cover different types of mobile application architecture, and in the next lecture, we will cover connection types, data synchronization methods, data transfer method. Let's start with the lecture. Before we start this lecture, let's understand what is architecture. The art of designing or building something is called architecture. Now we should know what is mobile application architecture. Mobile application architecture is a set of technique or pattern to build fully structured mobile applications based on industry standards and process that on wireless devices as smart mobile phones. This is an example of mobile architecture. A mobile application will normally be structured as a multi-layered application consisting of user experience, business, and data layers. This example is provided just for your reference. Now, let's start with the chapter. To design a mobile application, the architecture plays an important role, and to select which architecture to use, we need to consider these following points. Target audience, type of application, support of various mobile and non-mobile platforms, connectivity needs, data storage needs, connections to other devices, including IoT appliances. Now we will cover different types of mobile application architecture. So these are the different architectures which we can use for developing a mobile application. First one is client-side architecture, such as thin or fat client. Second is server-side architecture, such as single or multi-tier. Now we will cover each of these architecture in detail. In order to understand each of these types, first, we should know what a client and a server are. What is a client? A client is an application that runs on a personal computer or workstation and relies on a server to perform some operations. This is the client part of a client-server architecture. For example, enter URL in computer and it brings back website. So, here URL is a client. Now let's see what is the server. A server is a CPU or device on a network that manages network resources. Servers are often dedicated meaning that they perform no other tasks besides their client's tasks. And altogether, they are called client-server architecture. A client-server architecture is a network architecture in which each computer or process on a network is either a client or a server. Now we will see two types of mobile application architecture. First one is client side architecture, and second one is server side architecture. The first type of mobile application architecture is the client side architecture. As we know now, client means the application that runs on a personal computer or workstation and relies on a server to perform some operations. These apps use the web browser as the front end UI. JavaScript is the language used for implementing client-side logic. Client-side architecture is further divided into two types, thin applications and thick application. Let's see these two types in detail. A thin client is a network computer without a hard disk drive. Thin client apps do not contain application code, which is customized to the device and make minimal use of mobile operating system features. Clients, or computer, run only and exactly as specified by the server. Opportunity to use older, outdated PCs as clients. 
it has reduced security threat. Example, five computers with one processing CPU. Now let's move to thick client applications. Thick or fat client applications have multiple layers of application code and may use mobile operating system features. These are typically native or hybrid applications. It's more expensive to deploy as more work for IT in the deployment. Example, computer with one CPU. Now let's see some important points of client-side architecture. When developing a mobile application, one can opt to develop a thin web-based client or a rich client. If building a rich client, the business and data services layers are likely to be located on the device itself. If you are building a thin client, the business and data layers will be located on the server. The second type of architecture is server-side architecture. A CPU or device on a network that manages network resources is a server. And server-side architecture is divided into three types. Single-tier architecture, two-tier architecture, multi-tier architecture. Let's understand them one by one. In single-tier architecture, all processing or server in single computer. All resources attached to the same computer. They are less scalable. Harder to secure. Also known as monolithic. In two-tier architecture, application is split up into two. One part of the software is on the client, for example, web. One part of the software is on server, for example, database. And multi-tier architectures are layered architectures which allow separation of responsibilities, provide database specialization, provide better flexibility, scalability is high, more security, comparative expensive to develop, manage, and host compared to single-tier architectures. With this, we covered all three types of server-side architecture. Now let's summarize all the points. In this lecture, we covered two types of mobile application architecture, client-side architecture and server-side architecture. Client-side architecture is further divided into a thin client and thick client. And server-side architecture is of three types, single-tier architecture, two-tier architecture, and multi-tier architecture. In this lecture, we will continue with mobile application architecture. Here, we will cover these three topics. Connection types, data synchronization methods, and data transfer methods. Here, we will see what are the different ways with which we can connect to the server. A mobile device might be connected to the server using Wi-Fi, cellular data connections such as 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G, Bluetooth, or NFC, near-field communication. Mobile applications typically operate in one of the following three modes. Never connected apps, always connected apps, and partially connected apps. Never connected apps work offline. No internet is required, and for example, calculator app in mobile is a never connected app. Next is always connected apps. For this, continuous network connection required while using app. Mostly all mobile web applications need continued connection. For example, the WhatsApp app. And the third type is partially connected app. It requires an internet connection only for data transfer.
It can operate for long periods of time without connection. For example, the App Store Connect. After the connection is established, we should know how data can be synchronized. Here, synchronization is the operation or activity of two or more things at the same time. In this syllabus, we have two modes of synchronization, continuous mode and store and forward mode. In continuous mode, the data gets transferred as soon as it is submitted. And in store and forward mode, the data may be stored locally before being transferred, especially when no connectivity is available. Now let's see the data transfer approaches. Data transfer is any information that is transferred from one location to another through some communication method. Here, the sender data is called transmitter, and receiving data will be called receiver. This transfer of data can be possible in two ways. Synchronous, which is also known as continuous mode, or Asynchronous, which is known as store and forward mode. Let's see the two approaches in detail. First, we will see synchronous data transfer. In synchronous data transfer or in continuous mode, there is continuous stream of data signals followed by timing signals. Let's see some examples to understand this concept. Example 1. Suppose the client makes a call that go to the server and waits until data is receiving and then the response is sent back to the server. So here calling functions wait for the response before returning to server. Now let's see the second example. The client sends messages. This will go to server and waits till the message as in any one of the states sent delivered seen then we'll return response to client about the status of message for synchronous data transfer both systems sender and receiver should be active otherwise it will lead to time maintenance problems this is all about synchronous data transfer now let's see Asynchronous data transfer. In asynchronous data transfers intermittently rather than in a steady stream. For asynchronous communication, the receiving system does not have to be available at the time a functioning call is dispatched from the sender system. The receiving system can receive a process the call at a later time. For example, Windows. Sender has a upgrade available for laptop, but receiver not available for upgrade for a long time. Sender can still process the data that has been sent at a later time. Once laptop is available, it calls back the call inclined function. Once on completing the upgrade task, processes in the sending system remain unharmed. All the called function of upgrades are put in the sender system outbound queue. At the end, let's see the difference between synchronous data transfer and asynchronous data transfer. In synchronous data transfer, there is continuous stream of data signals followed by timing signals. In asynchronous data transfers, intermittently, rather than in a steady stream. For synchronous data transfer, both systems, sender and receiver, should be active. And for asynchronous communication, the receiving system does not have to be available at the time a function call is dispatched from the sender system. With this, the lecture ends. The statements will now appear on your screen. Please read them by yourself and identify the suitable architecture.
In this lecture, we will cover test strategy for mobile apps. Here, the learning objective is apply characteristics and specifics of the mobile marketing in preparing a test strategy. This topic is marked as K3. That means you will get an application based question here. This lecture is divided into two parts. In this lecture, we will cover eight risks or challenges which we shall consider in the test strategy. And in the next lecture, we will continue to cover the remaining risks. Let's see what the test strategy is. A test strategy is a plan for defining the approach to the software testing lifecycle. It guides the QA team to define test coverage and testing scope. The tester needs to understand while planning test strategy that there is a risk associated at all levels. Now the question is, what is the risk? Risk is a situation involving exposure to danger. And if test strategy is not done appropriately, we may get these risks. Business risk, monetary risk, resource risk, lives risk if dealing with healthcare domain. With this overview, now let's get back to the syllabus. For example, in the case of mobile application, we can have these two risks. Without knowing the device proliferation data in a particular geographic location, one cannot choose the devices on which the app needs to be tested in a sustainable fashion. Without knowing the type of business model, one cannot test whether the application behavior is a good fit for that business model. While creating a test strategy for mobile application testing, we need to consider these risks and challenges. The variety of mobile devices with device-specific defects on some of them. The availability of devices in-house or via the use of external test labs. The introduction of new technologies, devices, and or platforms during the application lifecycle. The installation and upgrade of the app itself via various channels, including preserving app data and preferences. Platform issues which might impact the application network coverage and its impact on the app in a global context. The ability to test using the networks of various service providers and the use of mobile emulators, simulators, and or real devices for specific test levels and types of tests. Now let's understand each one of them. The first risk is the variety of mobile devices with device-specific defects on some of them. Suppose an application is developed only for iOS, for example, Hilo Mom app. While making test strategy and seeing the latest devices trend the tester ops out of iPhone 4, means won't perform testing on iPhone 4. Later, after a release of application customers using iPhone 4 is not able to see her pregnancy date correctly, this device-specific issue will lead to patient care risk. While planning a test strategy, this thing needs to be considered. The second risk is the availability of devices in-house or via the use of external test labs. Devices in-house means available within the organization. External test labs can be simulator or emulator in the controlled environment. Suppose iPhone X is the most used iPhone as per analysis and tester needs to test on same. However, there is no availability of the same device in organization and simulator does not get connected to the test lab's environment due to configuration issue. This becomes a risk for the tester. 
While planning a test strategy, the availability of devices should be considered. The third risk is the introduction of new technologies, devices, and or platforms during the application life cycle. While application is in development phase, many new devices and operating systems will be rolled out in the market. This will be considered as a risk as there are more chances that our application might not be compatible with the new devices and OS. While planning a test strategy, these things need to be considered. The fourth risk is the installation and upgrade of the app itself via various channels, including preserving app data and preferences. Major risk is of application software not working on upgrading. Sometimes fails to get install in low-end devices like 4S. While planning the test strategy, this thing needs to be considered. The fifth risk is platform issues which might impact the application. iOS, Android, and Windows are mostly used platform in the mobile device application. While test planning, one should consider the scope of testing involves all the three platforms or not. Based on this understanding, one should go ahead and plan to test all the three platforms. The sixth risk is network coverage and its impact on the app in a global context. Network connectivity with app plays an important role. The different mobile operating systems provided by the different mobile companies. And for those mobiles, most of the mobile companies have their own mobile application market. While making a test strategy, one needs to consider network coverage and its impact on the app in a global context. The seventh risk is the ability to test using the networks of various service providers. The application should be tested on Wi-Fi, 3G, and the 4G network. It might be possible application works well on Wi-Fi, but not functional in the SIM card. This will lead to risk. While making a test strategy, one needs to consider this. The eighth risk is the use of mobile emulators, simulators, and or real devices for specific test levels and types of test. Mobile emulators, simulators, or real devices should be planned to use based on the level of testing and its type of testing. Suppose I am doing photos gallery testing. This will require real devices. While testing login emulators, simulators may work well. Use of mobile emulators or simulators can be in the early stages of development followed by real devices in later stages. Now let's summarize all the points. In this lecture, we covered these eight risks. The variety of mobile devices with device-specific defects on some of them. The availability of devices in-house or via the use of external test labs. The introduction of new technologies, devices, and or platforms during the application lifecycle the installation and upgrade of the app itself via various channels including preserving app data and preferences, platform issues which might impact the application, network coverage and its impact on the app in a global context, the ability to test using the networks of various service providers, and the use of mobile emulators, simulators, and or real devices for specific test levels and types of tests. Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Mobile Application Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB certified professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts, but also covers real-time examples. 
In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, two sample question papers. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and an experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB mobile application training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified.